Welcome everyone to another episode of CPAC Live. We have a couple of great guests uh, for you today. Yesterday, we had the great pleasure to sit down with Larry Kudlow, who's the president's top economic advisor. Uh, you, you're not gonna wanna miss that conversation. And after we hear from Larry, uh, we're gonna be joined by Dr. Ben Carson, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. I think there's so many questions. I, I have so many questions to ask Dr. Carson because he's an expert in so many fields and uh, he's actually now become an expert in an area of government policy as well, uh, as in one of these outsiders that have come into government. So let's listen to Larry and on the other side of that, uh, we'll be talking to Dr. Carson. It's our honor at CPAC Live to be joined by a great American, the director of the National Economic Council, uh, Larry Kudlow. Uh, director Kudlow, thanks for being with us on CPAC Live. Thank you, Matt. Always. Yeah, and it's hard to get you because uh, you've only had a few. You only have a few responsibilities to take care of uh, in the course of the workday. When people think of Larry Kudlow, they immediately think, "Please tell me what is going on in the economy." Can you give us your take? Well, that's that's one of my jobs. Um, yeah. Right now, the answer is much, much, much better. How's that? A lot of you see a lot of pessimism in the media, but um, I'm not buying. We're still in the V-shaped recovery camp, and a, a couple things here worth uh, noting. Many folks are saying, "Well, the uh, COVID-19 case rate has gone up, and it has gone up a lot. The virus moved, uh, you know." from northeast to south and now west. And therefore, some states are pausing in their reopenings uh, or they're not opening bars, uh, which is fine by me. I haven't had a drink in 25 years right. or other things. But we don't see yet any, um, any clear evidence that this uh, outbreak down south and southwest Sunbelt is affecting the economy. Now, it may, so July might not be as strong as we would prefer. May and June were hot as a pistol, and there's no question in my mind that um, the contraction ended uh, probably in late April, and we are in a self-sustaining recovery. Uh, you've had gangbuster reports on jobs, um, continuing unemployment claims, Retail sales, blockbuster, housing, blockbuster, automobiles, uh, production and sales and other manufacturing, blockbuster stuff, business applications, again, blockbuster stuff. They, every single one of them points to a V. ISM manufacturing, ISM services, you go down the list. And now I'll mention, too, that we're watching closely because it, it could signal a shift. One is the Apple Mobility Index. Now, that was, first of all, went up like a shot, about 125%. But it seemed to slip a bit in late June, early July. But in the last, I don't know, seven to 10 days, it's coming back, which is good. Um, others is one, oh, the restaurant, the um, whatever it's called, open restaurants or something. That has uh, slipped. Uh, it's not crashing down. It, it never went up that much to begin with. So I'm not here to say there's no impact from the surge in uh, COVID, uh, but I am here to say so far it's a very minor impact, maybe just moderating. I still think you're gonna have a V recovery. I still think the second half of the year grows by at least 20%, Matt. I still wow. think with, with good policies, you're gonna have a, a blockbuster year in, in 2021, again, with with the right policies. Let me just conclude with this thought, however. I, I'm saying this everywhere I go. If, if you want the economy to stay open, if you want the businesses to reopen, and therefore you want people to return to work and even create new jobs, which is something to be devoutly wanted, what you have to do as individual men, women, kids, is four things, follow the guidelines. Uh, masking, distancing, testing, and personal hygiene. These are the mitigation guidelines that we used successfully last winter. And now that we're having these hot spots down in the Southwest, 
These are exactly the mitigation guidelines, if put to use, that will work. And it's not a political thing. It's uh, a life-saving thing. Uh, we want the schools to reopen safely. We want the business to reopen safely. Again, I'll, I'll repeat it because there's some confusion. Um, distancing, masking, testing, and uh, good personal hygiene, cleaning your hands all day long. And that'll do it. And then we will have an absolutely roaring recovery. That's my view. And this uh, hot spot, so already we're seeing some progress. So that's how I see that overall economic picture, Matt. You know, on the question of uh, masking, there's all kinds of opinions and healthcare experts that say things. But my view is, is that especially if you're a store owner, um, I always ask the store owner, um, do you want, you, you know, do you feel more comfortable if people wear masks here? To me, if the baker has the right to make the cake or not make the cake, we all respect the person that owns the business. So when you read about these big chains saying you have to wear masks in their store, my view is, is that that's their right as the owner of that store to say that. And I also feel like when it comes to schools, we're fortunate, at least with our younger kids, that it looks like their schools are going to open, which for all of us working parents is just a desperately needed thing. Um, you know, they're going to have mass policies in their schools right. and our kids want to go back to school. And if that, as I told one of my friends, if I have to put myself in a Ziploc bag to get this economy started, I don't care. We got to get this economy started. There's no shame in wearing a mask or distancing. It's not a political action. You're not pro-Trump or against Trump or whatever. This is uh, all of us working together in a united way uh, to get rid of this virus and to reopen everything, including the schools, as you mentioned, and the economy. So folks, you know, we had spectacular job numbers uh, in May and June. We picked up 8 million jobs, fantastic, unemployment coming down. Let's do that every month. And let's deal with, you know, some of these, the hot spots, mostly 50% of them come from only four states. We're gaining in Arizona, looks much better. We still have problems in Miami, Southern Florida, and Texas and uh, California, although California may be a little better. My point is, those are the safety guidelines. Please, please use them. You're not only staying safe and you're not only helping the other person, you know, the mask you're wearing uh, helps the other person. Uh, uh, so it's not selfish. You're not only doing that, but you're also encouraging education and economic growth and jobs. It's really that simple. And that's why I've been emphasizing what I just said. Uh, Larry, uh, we're looking at a gangbuster uh, Wall Street. We're looking at these indices. Uh, some of these gains, uh, they're quite remarkable to see uh, day after day, week after week. Uh, I looked at some of my uh, updates on some of my accounts. I'm amazed how much ground uh, these uh, accounts have, have picked up since the shutdown. But the question then is consumer confidence. When we look at the market, are you also seeing consumers, individual consumer confidence rocketing up? Are you seeing them starting to spend these dollars? Are they starting to get back out there? Or is there like a little bit of a lag between the two? Well, all right, you got a couple questions embedded there. Um, consumer confidence has had a tremendous rebound. And you know, we keep looking at this conference board, uh, Bloomberg Comfort Index, uh, Michigan. The one I love is NFIB. That's a small business confidence, yeah. which continues to rise beautifully. So confidence has come back uh, quite a bit. So bear in mind that, again, I think the purchasing, uh, the payroll um, protection plan, the PPP, really had a positive impact and people did stay connected. Uh, they were furloughed, but only temporarily, and they're going back to work, 8 million back to work in the last two months, more coming. Um, so that's replenishing their income. We gave a lot of government income. You know, sometimes um, one of my mentors down through the years, Nobel Prize winner Robert Mundell, uh, used to say, you know, sometimes you have to operate on the supply side, sometimes you have to operate in the demand side. Well, we're operating on both sides. And we provided checks, we provided unemployment compensation, we provided small business assistance, we deferred tax dates, we deferred student loans, et cetera, et cetera. So you see it in the income. Incomes are rising. 
That's a great sign. The saving rate uh, in May was 33. I think in June it uh, came, it's about 25%. A normal saving rate in the U.S. is 3 to 5%. So people are sitting on a lot of cash and they're yeah. buying. That's why retail yeah. sales are up, uh, what, 18% some odd in May and another 7 or 8% in June. Car sales are booming. Uh, regarding the stock market, the stock market is a good indicator. Um, nothing's perfect, but it's a good indicator. Uh, I think there are a lot of retail people in the stock market. Actually, some of the institutional hedge fund type people miss this rally, T-E-E, but I think ordinary folks do. However, as I always tell you, and mercy, you buy stocks, buy the index, the whole basket. You buy all of American capitalism. And in fact, you can buy broader indexes that include w the world's economy, um, and you can do that excluding China. And you hold it for a long time. You do not trade it. You do not try to outguess the timing. You do not say, oh my God, this number did this and there I'm selling. You know, you would have missed. I mean, the market's up 45% yes. from the March 23rd lows. Very few people. Steve Mnuchin, I might add, Treasury Secretary, my friend and colleague, he and I said at the time, there are a lot of bargains out there for long-term investors. Right. It's a good time. And look what happened. Now, if, you were right. trying to, if you're trying to out-trade the market, you would have missed that. So, so I've, I've taken your advice at Mercy and I from the time when we we're in government. And neither one of, them are in, are, of us are in government. But our TSP accounts, just so you know, are fully loaded in the S&P index fund. And I don't plan on ever touching it. That's and it. I hope I have I hope I have a lot more years uh, to go, Larry, by the way. That's it. That's the best strategy. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, okay, so then if the economy, you, know, you talk about this amazing uh, V-shaped recovery, uh, the optimistic ideas of what will happen with growth, that millions of Americans are going back to work, consumers feel good, but yet we're reading about the fact that uh, uh, Senator McConnell and others are, are starting to put together another stimulus package. How should conservatives look at the need for another potential stimulus package? Well, that's a very good question, actually. And there's probably some debate going on about there that. There is. I just came from uh, the uh, Senate uh, conference, Senate policy conference uh, on the Republican side, up there with Chief Mark Meadows and uh, and Stephen Mnuchin. So I think this, there's still needs out there. There's still hardships out there. Um, I mean, unemployment coming down, but it's still too high, and jobs improving. But there's still 14.7 million unemployed. We, we can do better than that. And um, a lot of businesses, particularly small businesses, are worried. So I think I don't want to predict how this turns out, but I think there's broad agreement. Uh, we will probably help small businesses by extending the uh, payroll protection, which was a big hit and very, very effective. Um, I think we want to make sure that there's an incentive for folks to work rather than an incentive not to work. So that's right. The uh, controversial six hundred dollar federal uh, plus up for unemployment. We we're not going to end unemployment. I mean, some people are writing we're going to end unemployment assistance. That's just not true. We will put a cap of some kind. It'll be a fairly generous, but we will put a cap on total unemployment benefits. We may. Um, this is all pre-decisional, but we may uh, put a benefit, a reward in for re-employment. Uh, President Trump is very keen, uh, and so am I, on lowering the uh, payroll tax rate. It's a holiday. We might do it for five or six months. It could be done retroactively. Uh, there's 138, 9 million people who worked during this period, even though a lot of people lost jobs. It's a tragedy. But those who are working, we want to reward that. And we want to also say with the payroll tax cut, if you come to work, you'll be rewarded with a seven and a half percent increase in your take home pay, as Reagan used to call it. And it makes businesses cheaper to hire. So we're looking at those kinds of things. It'll be a smaller package than than last winter, last March, as it probably should be at this stage. And, um, you know, we'll still be helping people hopefully do no harm. 
So there'll be a lot of nicks and knacks. But I do think people should examine it and stay close to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think there's also a part of the uh, part of the, the conversation or the debate is the fact that you have done so much in a short period of time, but there's still gas in the tank of what Congress has already passed. And uh, so there's, you know, we, you got, you guys have tools that you can still use to try to take care of those folks who are hurting. And from, I think, most conservatives' point of view, the reason why they have been open to um, these packages like the CARES Act is because literally this is, we haven't done this before. We shut down the economy. Uh, we did it because of this terrible virus let loose by, uh, you know, whether purposefully or just bumbling uh, from the Chinese communist government. And, uh, and you know, we, we're in an area that we've never been in before. I wouldn't mind. I mean, this is me speaking, just me. This is not policy. Larry, yeah. it's just you and I, just you and I, just, just right. you and I no, talking here. No one else is listening. Um, but I wouldn't mind if we had a capital gains tax holiday. Not for financial assets, by the way, which are doing well, but, uh, you know, a lot of businesses have gone under, most regrettably, and a lot of assets, real assets, machinery, buildings, again, stores, you know, they've, they've lost 30 or 40 percent of their value. And I'd like to attract new capital investment, say, if you if you buy a real asset, buy a building, you buy a, a farm, a ranch, uh, you buy a big, uh, a big crane for construction. Uh, if you do that between now and the end of the year, you won't pay a capital gains tax on it for several years, if any. So I'd like to incentivize investment. And that's just me. Um, also, very important for investment, uh, which creates productivity, which increases real wages, um, you know, I wouldn't mind. We, we should keep the 100% uh, expensing. There were 100% immediate write-off uh, for plant and equipment, which was in the 2017 bill. The trouble is that thing starts to phase down in two years. I'd like to make it permanent and, um, and improve it uh, in various ways. So I'm interested in long-term economic growth incentives. I'm not just interested in the short-term stuff, although I get it, we're in a short-term period, but I'm interested in promoting growth through incentives. President Trump, as you know, is a tax cutter, yep. and he, he is a deregulator. Uh, his opponent, or on the other side of the aisle, is a tax increaser yep. and a re-regulator. I'd like uh, our side to make it very clear that the policies, the President Trump policies that worked, giving a very good economy, the best in a couple of generations before the pandemic, will work again and even better if we build on them. You know, I just uh, to make that point. Larry, you spoke at CPAC uh, in February, and our theme was. America versus socialism. Right. Now, this isn't your first time working for a Republican president. Obviously, you worked for President Reagan. When you look at the headlines, when you watch the scenes on your television set, when you see our cities on fire, when you see these big cities being poorly run with these terrible policies, and when you see so many people saying the answer to our problems is to have the national government, the federal government do more and take over more, did you ever think that we'd be in this place? And do you feel hopeful that we can get out of this place that we're in? Well, I'm always optimistic. I mean, uh, you know, I don't make systemic indictments of the United States. Good. I think this is the greatest country in the world. And our principles of freedom and democracy and equality uh, are the very principles that frankly, have helped minority groups down through the years. Um, and, you know, we all uh, bemoan John Lewis, who just passed away. Uh, Mr. Lewis was, you know, quite liberal on a lot of things, but his fight uh, to achieve uh, breakthroughs for blacks, you know, fair housing, voting, in my lifetime and yours, and his belief in nonviolence, he basically believed in voting in the American system. And my hat's off to him for that. I agree. I, 
And I think that, you know, the wonder of our system is uh, we have the capabilities to make changes. You know, we can elect a black president twice with 80 million white votes. I think that's a remarkable achievement. And whatever one thinks of President Obama, you can't take that away. That's a remarkable achievement. And um, we can fix, you know, if police, policing needs reforms, uh, so be it. Uh, we can achieve that also. On the other hand, some of these violent outbursts in these cities um, have to be controlled and changed and reined in. I mean, um, you, you just can't have that kind of behavior. So that's a very important part of this story uh, also. So I'm always optimistic. You know, I have lived through a lot of this stuff, um, certainly the riots of the 1960s. Um, and we've had some since that uh, since that time. But I, I believe in this country and I believe that our principles will prevail. Our principles of equality and um, and the rule of law and uh, the need for racial justice and all kinds of justice and opportunity and democracy voting will solve these problems as they have. We're a long way from where we were a couple hundred years ago, and we're a long way from where we were 50 or 60 years ago, and we keep progressing. And I think most Americans uh, have goodness in their hearts. I do not think they're discriminatory. Some do. Some Americans are, and I regret that. And so I'll be some cops too, but I regret that. Nonetheless, I don't think that's the majority. I agree with you, and it doesn't surprise any of our CPAC viewers that when it comes to the question of America versus socialism, Larry Kudlow is strongly on the side of an optimistic American future. Larry Kudlow, we really do honor you for the work you do there at the White House. I know the hours you keep and I know how hard the team works. I know how hard the president works. Uh, you, uh, you advise him very ably and you're right. This is the most deregulatory president we've ever seen. And uh, and what you what you all have done on taxes has been amazing. And then I'll add the third piece, which people often don't think about when it comes to the economy. And the third piece is because the president is picking uh, constitutionally bound judges and justices. You don't see so many judges going out and creating a new regulatory state like happens with the with the types of judges that get picked. Uh, yeah. by the other party. So what you guys have done on all these areas in the economy is amazing. And we appreciate you always helping us at CPAC and being with us today. Thanks. Take care, Matt. Appreciate it. All right. Go back to work, Mr. Kudlow. Bye-bye. That was a great conversation. I hope you felt the same way. And we love getting your feedback on these questions. And it's good to know that what uh, Larry Kudlow believes is we're in this V-shaped recovery. That's the critical thing. People can get back to school, safely. They can get back to work safely. Uh, you know, a company isn't going to make any money if it doesn't have customers. So it all starts with getting people back, buying things and, and, and making things in this country. Uh, it's now our honor to be joined by the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Dr. Ben Carson. Dr. Carson, thanks for joining us on CPAC Live. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be with you. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Carson, one of the things um, I always love about listening to you and, and reading what you say is the fact that you have a different perspective than most people who come into government. Obviously, you're, you're a man of the medical profession, but you're also just somebody who came into government with literally very little government experience because uh, you had had a successful career in the private sector. Uh, when you look at everything that's happening with this economic uh, shutdown and the coverage of the virus. Can you give our CPAC community hope uh, for how we'll finish finish 2020? Well, a lot of the a lot of my hope stems from the fact that I've had an opportunity to travel all over the country and meet people in every little hamlet, tiny little places in Iowa and North Dakota. And there are a lot of people in this country who have common sense. Yeah. And I don't think those people are going to be willing to give away what we have in this country. This is the destination country for people from all over the world. And uh, it's because of the possibilities that exist and the freedoms that exist in our country. And do we really want to trade that uh, for socialism, basically? 
And, uh, you know, we've seen what's been going on with some radical elements. Uh, no respect for the rule of law, no respect for other people's property, no respect for other people's feelings, you know, my way or the highway. And, and if you don't go my way, I will destroy you. I will destroy your business. I will destroy your livelihood. Is, is that what we really want in this country? And But what it means is that people are going to have to be willing to stand up for what they believe in. You know, when we sing the national anthem, we say we're the land of the free and the home of the brave. But you can't be the land of the free if you're not the home of the brave. You have to be willing to stand up for what you believe in. You can't stand in the corner or just cower and hope nobody calls you a racist or some other name. And uh, once we understand that, I think we'll be okay. But uh, recognize that the reason we have our freedom is because there are so many people before us who were willing to stand in the gap, who were willing to fight so that we could be free. You think about D-Day and all those young soldiers, many of them were underage, quite frankly, running onto those beaches and normally being slaughtered by the hundreds of thousand people laying there dead, stepping over them and overcoming the Axis forces knowing that they would probably never see their homeland again, never see their loved ones again. They didn't do it for themselves. They did it for us. Now the question is, what are we willing to do for those who are coming behind us? Are we going to stand in the shadows and let those with the loud voices who just want to run over everybody, are we going to let them control things or are we going to stand in the gap? That's the question. I believe that we have the willpower and the fortitude to stand in the gap. Do you think you could have accomplished what you've accomplished in your life uh, in another country, or do you think America gave you this unique opportunity? There is no question that America provides unique opportunities. I've been to 68 countries. I've lived overseas. I've been to a lot of very nice places, but I got to tell you, there is no place like this one. And this is not to say that it's perfect. It's not by any stretch of the imagination. Were, were there obstacles along the way? No question there were obstacles. Uh, were there people who tried to get in the way? Of course there were. Do you have to allow it? No. You can, you know, my mother used to always say, you can choose to be a victim or you can choose to be a victor. You decide which place you want to put your efforts. And today we have a lot of individuals who are trying to convince people that they are victims and that somebody else is causing their problems. And if we can just get rid of those people or get rid of those people's rights uh, and put you in the driver's seat, everything will be wonderful. That's not the way it works. You get there by your own hard work. That's the thing about America. And that's the reason that so many people want to come here in the beginning. Because, you know, they were serfs. They were taking advantage of every place. In this country, they could work and their own efforts would accrue to them. And, and that's what I found. But, uh, you, but you clearly, obviously, also have uh, had the experience of racism and bigotry as you've gone up this ladder. And, uh, ha I mean, uh, it, it didn't stop you. Well, you know, the way I kind of look at it, if, if somebody's a, rig, a, a racist or a bigot, that, that's their problem. You know, as my mother used to always say, you walk into an auditorium for the racist, bigoted people, you don't have a problem, they have a problem. Because, see, they're all going to cringe and wonder if you're going to sit next to them, whereas you can go sit anywhere you want. And, you know, that's kind of the way I've led my life. <laughs> I don't worry about that. So why should I let that be my problem? I've got more important things to do, to focus on getting something accomplished. Right. And the, the matter is, you know, we've come to a place where everybody wants to divide us up into little groups, you know, based on your race, based on your social economic situation, based on your religion, based on all kinds of different beliefs and then get all those little groups fighting each other. And really, that is the only way that this great nation can be brought down. It's not going to be brought down by Russia or China or Iran or North Korea, but it can be brought down from the inside. Right. Nation divided against itself cannot stand, and they know that. And I think there are people who are fomenting that division. And we have to be smart enough to re recognize 
you know, we're the ones who actually live in a beautiful house and everybody else is saying, oh, that's a terrible place. You don't really want to live there. And <laughs> trying to get fighting and, and, and not really appreciating what we have. It's the house on the hill, as Reagan uh, taught us. And, uh, you know, I always think when I think of uh, what, what I have to experience when I go in some media platforms and be lectured to about the racism of the Republican Party or the racism of the conservative movement, it makes me mad. And people sometimes say, uh, you're too emotional in your responses because I hate the idea that the values that we hold on to, that they're going to smear them and call them racist. And when I think about when you ran for president, for instance, you led in a lot of polls. You led nationally for a period of time. You led in with electorates that were overwhelmingly white. Uh, clearly, that's a demonstration that um, they were listening to what you were saying. They weren't focused on you know, what group they can put you in. Do you think the Republican Party and Trump supporters broadly, do you think they should stop apologizing for what happened in someone else's lifetime and start being accountable for what's going on in their life? Absolutely. Uh, you know, when you stop and you think about the history of our nation, and I understand why some people are anxious to erase it, because, uh, you know, you look at the people who actually uh, were proponents of slavery, and uh, you look at the people who did the Jim Crow, uh, activities and segregation and who were against voting rights and who were against civil rights. Uh, now they say that that's all flipped. And, uh, you know, now it's the Republicans who are like that. <laughs> but what a bunch of foolishness that is. Um, what we really need to do is make sure that people understand what the real history is of our country. And let's learn from those things you know, rather than demonizing each other and getting in our respective corners and fighting all the time, let's learn from those things and progress forward from them. You know, when it comes to, you know, tearing down the monuments and destroying the history, what we need to recognize is if, if you want to fundamentally change a society, first thing you have to do is destroy their history because their history gives them their identity. And then if you can destroy their identity, you can destroy their beliefs because they don't have any beliefs. And if they don't have any beliefs, they become very easy to manipulate. We have to be smarter than to just buy all this garbage that these people are putting out there. We've got a great situation here, and we've got to make it greater. And for those who are, who are not doing well, we have to think about ways to fix that. What is the best way to get somebody out of poverty? It is education. And, uh, you know, you can take somebody from the worst ghetto, uh, from Appalachia, it doesn't matter. And you give them a good education, they write their own ticket in our and, and that's one of the reasons that we're going to be announcing uh, our uh, housing choice voucher mobility demonstration, which we uh, provide an opportunity for families with children uh, to move to areas where there are better schools and support that uh, so that they can get the kind of education. But these are families who want to do that and families who have a desire to take advantage of the things that this country provides. And those are the kinds of families that we really want to help to be able to achieve the American dream. So what you're saying is the Department of HUD is partnering with those people around the country that believe in this concept of school choice, that people should be able to raise their kids in the communities that they wish to raise them, including going to the schools, uh, including uh, any kind of public school uh, that is best for their kids. And uh, But you can't tell them they have educational choice if they don't have the ability to actually live near that school. Well, you know, it, it's amazing to me that, particularly in a lot of our cities, uh, we have these politicians who are against school choice. Yeah. And, and they must in their heart know that that is confining these children probably to a life of failure. It makes all the difference in the world. You know, I remember, you know, as a youngster growing up in poverty, first of all, I hated poverty. You know, some people hate rats and roaches. I hated poverty. Uh, that is until my mother made us start reading books. 
and uh, we couldn't go outside and play. We had to stay in the house and read books. And we didn't like it very much in the beginning. But after a while, I really began to enjoy those books. I was reading about explorers and scientists, entrepreneurs and surgeons. And I began to understand that the world was much broader than this piece of the tree. And that the person who had the most to do with what happened to you in life was you. And uh, then I began to really see the opportunities that were around. And I didn't just confine myself to the failing high school that I went to. I started going out and getting involved in lots of things that were going on around the city at Wayne State University and all these things availing myself of those opportunities. That's something that a lot of children miss. And if you expose them to those opportunities, they flourish like a plant that's watered. But if you don't, they tend to gravitate toward the things that are going on around them and not broaden their horizons. And, and that's what we have to think about because we can't afford to throw away anybody. We only have 330 million people. That's a quarter of what China has, a quarter of what India has. We have to compete with them in the future. We have to develop all of our people. If we don't do it, we're not going to be able to compete with the future. The, um, what, one of the things we talk a lot about here at the American Conservative Union is the dignity of each person. No matter what their characteristics are, no matter what boxes they check, uh, they have dignity. When I have read about some people have said $1.2 billion that, is, that these radical groups, these socialist Marxist groups that are fomenting this racial hatred and violence, really murder, the death of a lot of kids of color, quite honestly, uh, in our big cities. I think about what could be done with a billion two for kids in poverty. Some of them are going to be forced to go to school online with parents that have to go to work and leave them and can't afford to find daycare. Uh, you know, we, there's a lot of families that are going to be in crisis again. What could be done with that money to help kids? And instead, uh, those kids could be victims of the violence. No question about it. Uh, one of the things that is going on with this administration is uh, you may have heard of the Envision Centers. I was actually visiting one in Jacksonville, Florida uh, on Monday of this week. And these are places that amalgamate the various services that are meant to uplift people and bring them all under one roof so that that young woman uh, who has, you know, tots in her house and never got her GED, now has a place that she can go where they will help her with childcare, where they will help her get her GED, maybe advance to a better degree, become self-sufficient, teach self-sufficiency to her children, and break the cycles of poverty. And, you know, in the past, the government hasn't really thought that way. We thought more about, there, there, you poor little thing, I'm going to take care of you. But we really have a, a better responsibility in that we really need to set people on a trajectory towards success because the more successful people we have, the stronger our country becomes. Uh, Dr. Carson, I want to end this conversation. And once again, we want to thank you for making time in your busy schedule for us. Obviously, the president uh, started up uh, an update on where we are in Chinese corona yesterday at the White House. Um, Tell us, with your medical experience, you know, in the hype and the news that we're seeing on our television sets about how we're ready to have some amazing super spreading event in, in states of Texas and Florida. But many of us are looking at the mortality rate and see that it's gone down every day for three months. Tell us what's really going on and how, what, what's, your, what's your perspective on, on how we're going to handle this, this next uh, phase? Well, we've learned a lot about this virus and how to manage it. And what we need to emphasize now is that people need to follow the guidelines, the hand washing, the social distancing, the mask wearing. When we did that a couple of months ago, it had a dramatic impact. And then we said, eh, we don't need to do that. You know, particularly a lot of the young people because they recognized that they were not particularly vulnerable you know, to death or major morbidity. Uh, what they don't seem to realize is that they can be asymptomatic spreaders. And it, it seems that the majority of people now uh, who have the virus 
actually have no symptoms or very little in the way of symptoms. And they can easily spread it. So what we need, the message that we need to get out now, we need to get this to everybody we can. If you're a young, vigorous individual, just assume that you're an asymptomatic area. And particularly when you're around elderly people and vulnerable people, you know what to do to make sure that you don't spread it. Make sure you do it. And we will depress this thing very quickly. The good news is that there are several uh, vaccines that are ready to go into stage three trials uh, within the next month. This is going to make a big difference. We're way ahead of schedule on that. I don't know when it's going to come out. But there are also some therapeutics that are being worked on, uh, one of which is very exciting. It actually interferes with the ability of the virus to produce a protein envelope that protects it against the antibodies. And it also competes on the receptor sites of the cells with it, so on two different levels. And uh, preliminary results in the laboratory have been just unbelievable. Um, and as soon as we get through all, all the, the bureaucratic stuff, and uh, that's going to make a huge difference. Uh, that's really great to hear, Dr. Carson. I can't tell if you think I'm either young or vigorous, but uh, I'm going to act like I'm young and vigorous, okay? And, uh, and I think that's a great way to have the attitude. I think the president, by the way, thinks he's young and vigorous, too. The, um, <laughs> we appreciate you being with us, sir. We appreciate all the great work you're doing uh, at the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, and your message generally is very uplifting, I think, at this, in these times. Uh, and we're uh, gonna be right back with a conversation and some final thoughts on what's going on in the country and what's going on in our cities, uh, what's going on in our streets, uh, right after this compilation of some of the, the, some of the scenes we've been seeing over the last couple of days. There's no end in sight to the protests gripping Portland. For more than 50 days, marchers have taken to the streets, only to be met in recent days by a force of federal agents, men without badges or ID, acting on orders of President Donald Trump. Didn't deter me. It made, deter me. It made me, in fact, want to go back. Police video captured a violent attack on officers who were protecting the statue of Christopher Columbus during a protest Friday night in Grant Park. What began as a peaceful protest at Grant Park Friday evening devolved into a very dangerous situation in which mob action deliberately sought to injure officers. Mark, things have quieted down a little bit in the past half hour or so, but if you take a look behind me, there are still police cruisers lining the middle of High Street and protesters on the sidewalk. This a much different scene than what we've been seeing the past several weeks. When we see these images of basically cities in America on fire, we read about the crime, we read about the deaths, a lot of young kids getting killed as a result of this violence. Um, you know, it doesn't feel like we're in America. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, in a lot of these cities, it's uh, it's of short duration. Here in Washington, D.C., we had a couple weeks of serious protests. But I'm fascinated looking out on the West Coast at Portland. These things have been going on on the West Coast for 50 days. They're not going away anytime soon. These uh, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, Inc., these uh, protesters are getting better. They're getting more competent. They're even better funded, more organized. They're behaving like paramilitary operations uh, uh, in urban areas. Well, it's important to understand that the primary characteristics of these American-hating, violent uh, organizers is that uh, this is not grassroots and spontaneous, folks. This is very, very, as Ian says, it's organized. It's incredibly well-funded. Uh, some people said 1.2 billion. Unfortunately, it's come from too many corporate boardrooms, too many philanthropists. In the in the spirit, of what they tell us of creating racial harmony or giving black voices in a, a chance to be listened to in a special way. But the result of these uh, donations is kids aren't getting laptops to get ready for school. There's no meals being given out. There's no special tutoring or training. Black pastors aren't getting this money. It's not going to the programs that Dr. Carson talked about in our interview that are in, people who are intervening in black families to do, give them the support they need, which is the foundational foundation to any 
society or culture. Um, that's not where the money's going. You know, uh, we re- recently were in uh, a couple of big airports, and you know, we saw in a mostly vacant airport the presence of Black Lives Matter with their T-shirts and everything. White kids traveling around the country, fomenting uh, what I consider to be violence, racial animosity, and um, they're not doing it on their own dime. Uh-huh. I don't think, uh, and I, I, it's really important that what the president's doing in Portland is to say, look, we've all sat by and watched this. How many days over 50 days? 50 days plus, 50 days plus in Portland. In in the end, the president has an obligation, starting with the federal courthouse and federal uh, real estate and buildings, to bring back order or more people of color and people generally are going to get slaughtered. Well, if when you're on the road and you're at the airport, I would would ask you to, you you know, don't be afraid to engage in dialogue with one of these kids and ask them what anything that they've done, how it's improved a single uh, 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 black life in America. All right. All of these actions. And this is this is killing me, have, have done nothing to improve any lives. You can change the name of the sports team. You can uh, write it on the NBA courts and stuff. Not a single life has been improved. And you, I was listening to you talk to Dr. Carson earlier in the program. And this is a guy uh, who was a, the ultimate role model. Uh, for young men, young black men, when I was a kid, you got that that gifted hands book underneath the Christmas tree. And even if you live in a fatherless household, uh, lower middle class income, uh, your mom told you, grow up and be like Dr. Carson, dream big, achieve, get an education, figure out how to become successful. And uh, I don't know how we've gotten so far away from those important lessons that, uh, you know, he's lived his life and shown so many. Uh, 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 people that are my age, kids that were my age. We held them in high regard. And now uh, he gets canceled, as he talked about in the interview. Uh, I've been canceled. Uh, we've had donors uh, who give money to the American Conservative Union be contacted to say why you're giving to a group that, uh, you know, has some kind of racist leanings. Um, basically, they want to make being a Republican racist. They want to make being a conservative racist. They want to say that having our uh, point of view, and even though we have great diversity in our opinions on lots of issues as a community, they want to say that somehow that's illegal. They want to make our activities illegal. Um, You know, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they take the next step and try to say somehow shut down the ability of us, not even for because of Chinese Corona, which we're already seeing evidence of, but just because of our values, shut down our events going forward. We're in a very, very dangerous place uh, in American history. Um, we're in a place we really have not been to before. And we've had, had terrible uh, parts of our past where the First Amendment literally was shut down. Obviously, not everybody uh, enjoyed the full rights of the First Amendment. But in a modern context, we've never really been shut down like this. And we thought that the kids in school, yeah, they're a little more rambunctious. They tend to be a little more progressive was the euphemism we always use, but then a lot of the grandparents would tell us, well, just wait till they start getting their first job uh-huh. and they start paying taxes and they get married and they have a kid. Everything, uh, changes. everything changes and they get more practical. But the difference is the kids of a generation or two ago still were taught to revere George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, uh, Harriet Tubman, you, bet. Uh, you know, the people in this country that did amazing things, Christopher Columbus, who had the courage to prove to the whole world that the world wasn't flat. We take it for granted today. That was a big deal. <laughs> you know, you were going to fall off the edge of the earth. They're not taught that anymore. They're taught to hate these people. They're taught to hate America. They're taught that America is a cesspool. So what you find is, is that even when they go through these seminal moments as individuals getting married, getting a job, paying taxes, having kids, they are uh, too many of them are holding on to this idea that America needs to be fundamentally transformed, which is the same thing as saying America should be scrapped. This is the question that's on the table. I mean, you know, you and I both agree. What do you call it? You call it the, uh, the slavery, the birth defect of, uh, of the founding of America. Obviously, uh, uh, a, 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 a terrible practice. But does it outweigh all of the good things that America has done over the past 200 plus years? Well, the whole the, the answer to that is, is that. It was the genius of the founders that knit into the Constitution the ability to fix the problems right. that they knew they couldn't fix at that time. They knew it. But they were they hopeful. Knew it. Oh, they all talked about it. They were hopeful that because of that, 
that these problems could be fixed. And we talk a lot about slavery, but the other issue, uh, which was a birth defect, was the fact that women couldn't vote. Right. Women couldn't own property. Women weren't always thought about when we thought about uh, uh, the fundamental rights about being an American citizen. So uh, in many ways, uh, we have repaired uh, the unequal treatment of individuals. That should make us be proud of our country. And that mechanism to repair whatever's wrong now still exists. It does still That's exist. That's the wonder of the American democratic system that but, you've but, got elections and a constitution. Yeah, and but liberals, can... and we used to call them liberals, they're not liberals. The fascists, the Marxists, they don't want to have constitutional amendments to change the constitution. No, this is, uh, they want five votes on the Supreme Court. Rule by force. And if Joe Biden becomes president, he's going to pack that court. He's going to add more members. It won't be nine members of the Supreme Court. He's going to pick up FDR's old plan to pack the court, and he's going to add members uh, to the court. They're going to get rid of the filibuster in the Senate. So it's going to be a simple majority in both the House and the Senate. In the House, you don't even have to be there to vote. Nancy Pelosi can vote for up to 10 members with one single proxy. So it takes a very small minority to push very radical and extreme un-American change. And, uh, and, and I think the problem with what's happening with the violence in our streets is I think most decent people look at it and they're really disgusted, shocked, and they want it to stop. But because we're so cowed and silenced by corporations, Shh, foundations, can't say that, Matt. Can't, can't say, say that. it places where we work because we'll get persecuted for loving our country. You get fired. People that are, you know, they can't speak their mind in their own offices. You can't even criticize groups that say we're going to rip down statues of Jesus and Mary and are burning down churches. But we're in a really bad place. And I think both yeah. you and I agree um, what we're going to do at ACU is keep talking and we're not going to whisper. We're going to take the consequences. We're going to keep talking. What we're saying uh, is in the zone of what people need to hear. And let's stand with our friends. Yeah, that's let's right. support. Let's support them and make sure that uh, they know that we've got their back. That's right. We're all in this together. And I think it's a worthy cause. Someone I really respect said it's almost like the refounding of the country. And I think that's exactly right. And we're going to be with uh, everybody on Friday as well, where I'll be talking to the man with the most conservative voting record uh, of all the senators, uh, Senator Mike Lee from Utah. We're talking to the correct senator from Utah, mind you. <laughs> the, and you'll uh, right. be having a conversation, too. Uh, I'm going to talk with Rich Lowry from National Review, the man that Bill Buckley uh, you know, named heir apparent to carry on uh, that Buckley legacy. And who specifically has been a great voice in this whole question of ripping down statues and cancel culture and such. Excellent. So it's going to be a great show. We love uh, being with you. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And we'll see you in 48 hours. Talk to you soon.